The speechwriter Graham Freudenberg is an absolute legend of the Labor Party. He's worked for a string of Labor Party leaders, Kim Beasley, Bob Hawke, Neville Rann, all the way back to Arthur Caldwell in the early 1960s. He is most remembered, though, for his work with Gough Whitlam. And now... Graham Freudenberg has decided to donate his private archive of documents and original speeches and political ephemera to the Whitlam Institute. Among the most famous of his Whitlam speeches was the 1972 Blacktown campaign launch in Western Sydney that saw Labor return to office after 23 years of continuous Liberal rule. Men and women of Australia, there are moments in history when the whole fate and future of nations can be decided by a single decision. For Australia, this is such a time. It's time to create new opportunities for Australians. Time for a new vision of what we can achieve in this generation for our nation and for the region in which we live. It's time for a new government. It's time, and from that famous campaign launch came a campaign theme song unlike anything that had ever been heard before in Australian politics. M. Young, Ainsley Avenue, Canberra, for the Australian Labor Party. And for those of you that might be tapping your foot to that in remembering, I don't want to make you feel old, but that was 39 years ago. Can you believe it? Well, Eric Sedoti is director of the Whitlam Institute at the University of Western Sydney, and he has gratefully received the Freudenberg Collection. Eric Sedoti, welcome to breakfast. Thanks very much, Fran. Uh, let's go to the most significant item in this collection, I suppose, which is the, uh, the original of the It's Time campaign proposal, the 1972 election campaign proposal. You've had a good look at it. What's revealing about this? What struck you? It struck me that it was a somewhat reminiscent of Mad Men in some respects. You know, it, it's an extraordinary document. It was written in December 71. Uh, we've got one of uh, the 10 original copies, I think the first of the 10, in fact. Uh, what really hits you is, is that the, the nascent growth of the PR consultant and the expert pollster in helping to fashion and guide not just the campaign but the political strategy behind the campaign. And it's written out there in, in terms that today would seem very naive almost, you know, because we all take them for granted. And what is a focus group? They, you know, they how explain do you what a focus Indeed. group is. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's extraordinary to read it, uh, these concepts being introduced. I mean, uh, I was really struck about the way they actually explain image and uh, that image is not really deceptive. It's just part of normal uh, behaviour that you put this uh, what we'd call spin on, on do they use politics. the word spin? They don't. They talk about putting a mask on. I they think. do. Yeah, that's right. Exactly right. Uh, I'll tell you what's extraordinary about it too, that the uh, budget for that New South Wales campaign in 1972 federal election was $100,000. Yes, that's right. And if you, when you read it, you also see that part of the uh, campaign strategy was to encourage donations of a dollar to the uh, to the Labor Party as part of their campaign strategy in engendering support. Um, which is a bit comical now, but of course, at the time, uh, the, these were profound figures in terms of what was being uh, intended to be spent on basically advertising, PR promotion. Uh, and of course, it was the the genesis of the swing, the marginal seat strategy. They talk about the swing seats. They target them quite uh, specifically. They're very explicit about what the intention is, how they would design it for one seat to start with, and then it's spread it out to other seats. Um, the use of um, guided campaign materials and training for local candidates. Uh, these were all, um, you know, new concepts. In it's the, the birth of the modern political campaign, isn't it? The marginal seat campaigning, the use of focus groups, the guided messages, celebrity endorsements. It's where it all started. Uh, absolutely. Goff's government, of course, the Whitland government, catapulted Australia into the modern world, uh, and not just in terms of its parliamentary reforms and its reform of the Labor Party, but also in terms of its style of campaigning, its uh, sophistication uh, in that 72 campaign. And it's a real example of the more things change, the more things stay the same. The strategy finds, and it's advising the uh, party apparatchiks, that um, voters think that the unions run the Labor Party. They're worried about the influence of faceless men. There's a perception that Labor can't afford the promises it's making. In other words, it can't be trusted with the economy. And also that immigration is a potential disaster area for Labor. This could have been the 2010 campaign. Uh, look, absolutely. And I think it reinforces the notion that uh, history stays with us. I mean, the characteristics that uh, 
historically defined, whether it's the Labor Party or the Liberal Party or whoever, uh, stay with us. And unless we really get to grips with that, we uh, continue to fall into the, the same traps. And uh, I think we've also seen that in recent times. And really, it's a laugh out loud moment when you read Gough Whitlam's letter to the then New South Wales Premier. This is one of the documents given to you. Uh, Sir Robert Askham in 1974 proposing a federally funded Parramatta to Epping railway line in Sydney. Now, if I'm not mistaken, that's the same rail line that was promised by Julia Gillard at the last election 36 years later. Yeah, exactly. No wonder the voters are a little cynical. No, indeed. And and Goff offered it uh, to pay for the whole thing, basically, except for the staffing. Uh, and that was oh, so in- some things do change. <laughs> yes, yeah, indeed. But that was in February 1974, as you, as you say, and it followed a letter from the New South Wales Transport Minister, Milton Morris, in the, in the Herald a couple of days before that. Uh, the irony, again, is that uh, the feasibility was done, and as I understand it, the funds were actually never provided by the Fraser government. Eric, when private collections are donated from historical figures, it's often the case that the archivists don't absolutely know the value of what they're getting. There might be some hidden handwritten note or reference that doesn't mean anything in isolation, but in fact is historically significant. Could that be the case here? Do you know what you've got? Oh, it's absolutely the case here. One one of the beauties of Graham's donation is that he's actually spent now already several days with our archivist going through the documents one by one. And what it really reinforced for us is that uh, the significance and the context in which some of these documents took place would have been lost to us if we didn't have his personal um, supervision, if you like, of, of the care and provenance of them. You know, Give we've, us an example of that. Well, there's one document that uh, will be up online very, very shortly. We're in the process of digitising things. Uh, but it, it was a statement that was prepared in the wake of the 74, the 18th of May 1974 election. I mean, most people forget that Gough was actually elected two terms. He was a two-term Prime Minister. Uh, and there was a discussion about when they would actually accept uh, uh, victory, and it was held off for several days. Now, the, st- the handwritten document and the statement and the changes are instructive in themselves between Graham's original draft and, and the version that Gough eventually delivered, but they held up the uh, acceptance speech for three or four days uh, and created a vacuum of uncertainty as to the um, the strength of their their win. So the document itself is instructive in terms of the draft, Goff's changes, the change of tone, but also the context in terms of which it was delivered. And we only know that because Graham was there to tell us. And what about the dismissal? Any any documents shed any new information there? Uh, not so much the, the dismissal as such um, because Goff's papers are really a pretty definitive in terms of what he's given us already and there'll be more coming from that direction. Uh, but, for example, he, d- he did have a folder of documents on Vietnam, uh, which is an extremely significant folder of material. And uh, we would expect that the historians will get their teeth into that, you know, one day fairly soon. Okay. And this, um, this collection, it's available to the public? Uh, anyone can access all of it? The Whitlam Prime Minister Collection is already one of the most significant in the country. We've got the original letter of dismissal and a number of other really key documents. The letter from the Governor-General? Indeed. Uh, uh, and, and so it, and part of our overriding uh, concern is to make sure that it's accessible. I mean, we don't want to just lock it away. So we've had a, a program for some years now Week after week, we've got uh, two people working, digitising the full collection, Goff's papers. So it is available online through our website at whitlam.org. Uh, and these documents will eventually all go up as well. OK, the Whitlam paper's already there. Now the Freudenberg paper's added to that, which reveal the development of this near 50-year friendship between Graham Freudenberg and Gough Whitlam. Eric Sadoti, thanks very much for joining us. Anytime. Eric Sadoti is Director of the Whitlam Institute at the University of Western Sydney. And again, if you want to view some of the Prime Ministerial Collection, the Whitlam Collection online, go to whitlam.org. You're listening to Radio National Breakfast. It's quarter past eight.